Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 16 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my good friend and co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome to the new year, folks. Uh, Good to have you guys back. Uh, Happy belated new year. Uh, This is our first episode of 2015. We are looking forward to a new year. 2015, as as I've mentioned elsewhere, we are now in the future. (laughs) That's right. You want to drop the the yeah as a as a film geek, uh, you know, right? Isn't 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 this the year that they go back or they go to in the future and back to the in, future? In Back to the Future, all I wanted was a hoverboard, and I did not get a hoverboard. The and, world uh, let you down. It really did. It, it you know. Have you, guys heard about, have you guys seen this video on YouTube of uh, the coded like nine eleven references in Back to the Future? Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> oh my god, you haven't seen the thing. Oh, this is crazy, dude. But I oh, but is... I have seen I have seen a video of the coded nine eleven messages in that what's that other movie, Bring It On or something? Yeah, that was No, I got your coded nine eleven message right here in my plate of biryani. What are you gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> now, but, now, but, yeah. But, 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 hold on, hold on. In all, in all seriousness, you need to Google this. This is like a thing called crypto mysticism. Oh my gosh. Okay. And people are like just Connecting dots. Now, again, it seems like they're absurd, perhaps from the, from the outside, but I'm not gonna lie to you, man. This nine, this uh, the, this deconstruction and decoding of the Back to the Future 9/11 thing is freaking creepy, dude. It's so weird. It's so weird. You have to watch it. You have to watch it. I, I, I need to look this up now. No, and, and and for our audience, right. uh, the person that you've just heard for the past three minutes talking about <laughs> the coded 9/11 messages in Back to the Future, that is uh, comedian uh, Azhar Usman, and uh, Azhar is an uh, old old friend of mine. I mean, my gosh, I've I've known Azhar for, uh, um, gosh, what is it, Azhar? Like 20 years now. More than probably 20 years. Oh my yeah. gosh, we're, that, that means we're very old. But mashallah. We've been pervasive as well for over 20 years. And, I was just going to uh, say, we all, all three of us here, yeah. Although Zucky and I don't know each other that long, um, as long as you and Zucky know each other and as long as me and you know each other. There we right. go. There's, there's something coded there, too. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, what we've established is there's absolutely no reason for the three of us to be recording a conversation between old friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as an exercise in... I don't know what it is. Weird postmodern <laughs> sharing of our private ideas with public people. <laughs> now, now uh, it's worth pointing out here that that Azhar really requires no introduction in the Muslim community. Azhar is so famous that he's just he's a one name. He's like Madonna and Cher. It's just Azhar. Oh, everybody knows Azhar. It's so ridiculous. Are you saying these things just to like hurt my feelings? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. I'm trying to think of a male one name person. I can't. I, I really. I'm. I'm drawing a blank Bono. here. But Bono. Uh, Bono. Okay, there you go. He's like Bono. Bono. Uh, sure. Which, yeah. which which some some might find more offensive. I don't know. I'm I'm not one of those. People. But uh, for for those of you who who need an introduction, I've I've spent years. I want to write a book actually about because um, I have a lot of friends who actually are famous and like famous people. Like they they, yes. are, they have celebrities, or they're on the verge of fame. And they're kind of about to pop, right? And the vantage point from of those people when they the way they relate to quote unquote celebrity and fame, and I, people have this perception. Some people, anyway, among the Muslim community, that somehow <laughs> Astaghfirullah Azhar Aswan is famous, which is such a it's such a laughable proposition to me because I actually know real famous people. Like I've <laughs> hung out with. You know, Russell Peters in his hotel room, for example, he's just a regular dude. Like the guy had diarrhea that night and had to go to the bathroom <laughs> and was having difficult time. So the absurdity of what is fame, right? Fame is just people know who you are. Well, people know who everybody is. Sure. Your parents know who you are. Your friends know who you are. Your neighbor knows who you are. So the only difference is, oh, well, more people know who you are. And people who you don't know know who you are. So who cares? Like why, why does it have any relevance whatsoever it's such a weird bizarre type of currency you know fame is fame has been called fool's gold sure. by chef gordon have you seen a documentary by about chef gordon called supermensch no i haven't michael um myers the comedian from center live and sure. 
great sketch artist. He made a documentary uh, about this guy called Shep Gordon, called Supermensch. Shep Gordon is like this Hollywood super manager who managed like, you know, 20 massive, huge acts from no, from being nobody to becoming massively successful bands. So his meditations on fame and the nature of fame are like really profound. And he just says in an interview about the film, like fame is fool's gold. Huh. Uh, it actually destroys a person's soul, generally speaking. Sure. In fact, he said, he said, I got to a point where I would tell my clients if they had real talent, I would tell them in the beginning, like, listen, uh, I'm interested in managing you, but I'm going to warn you right now, if I do my job correctly, I will probably end up killing you. Wow. But he would say it in dead seriousness. Sure. So anyway, it's just a weird – anyway, the fact that you would introduce me like that makes me feel really <laughs> bad. And... Well, you know, I mean, let, well, first of all, let, let, me, let, me, let me give you an intro here so that uh, uh, those of us – those of uh, people in our audience who, who may not be familiar with you, the few who may not be familiar with you, uh, Azhar Usman was called America's Funniest Muslim by CNN and was named among the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by Georgetown University. In 2010, comedy icon Dave Chappelle commented, Azhar Usman is untouchable. Trained as an attorney, Azhar has been a professional stand-up comedian for over a decade, performing at comedy clubs, theaters, festivals, campuses, conferences, conventions, and private events all over the globe. He's performed in over 20 countries. His self-produced underground comedy album, Square the Circle, was released in 2003 and went on to gain a cult following among English-speaking Muslim communities worldwide. So that's impressive, my friend. Um, it sounds impressive, but it's also like I wrote it. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> Which is which is also impressive that that you were able to to get you know actually Ezra I do need to tell you a story here and I need to share this with the audience now uh, shortly after um, I got married I had mentioned to my wife that you and I are friends and she said no you don't you don't know Ezra you know she's like oh you're trying to impress me I'm like I'm friends with I've I've known him for a long time she's like yeah, you, yeah, to after you already married her <laughs> <laughs> well I was you know yeah I was it's a continuing process you know that. <laughs> I, I trust me. I know exactly how it works. <laughs> so, so you came and did a show at at the MCA here in the Bay Area, and I was like, "Listen, I'm telling. Look, he, he's my friend. You know, maybe after the show, I can introduce you." So, so you're performing, and I happen to be like the front row or the second row, and you happen to see me, and you mention me in your act. I don't know if you remember this. Oh yeah, legit, you me, son. You remember you, that? You massive juice, huh? Your wife was like, "What?" Well, no, that's the problem because my wife was actually out of the room. She was, okay. So, so I'm like, see, and I'm looking around, and she's, she, so yeah. <laughs> I think she still doesn't believe we know each other. Actually, I'm pretty sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the on the podcast. <laughs> but, look, but you, regard, know, you know, why, you know, why yeah. I've always had fun. You know, look, you and I, you and I have that one of those, like friendships and relationships end up falling into different types of buckets, right? You and I have one of those relationships where we don't really hang out very often. No, we don't see each other very often, but. I know that we are very spiritually aligned. I know that we're basically on the same page, like theoretically, conceptually, uh, ethically, aesthetically. Uh, you and I sh have shared a passion for entertainment and film for many years at a time when, like, you would want to write film reviews and other Muslims are still like, oh, but I don't watch movies. You were just like, <laughs> you were in a different, you had a different relationship with, with entertainment because you understood that really, either intuitively or intellectually, that Really, entertainment in the modern world is mind control. Yeah. And those who tell the stories control the world, you know? So yeah. mass media is, uh, is basically an instrument and an instrumentality for dictating the cognitive frames, the worldviews, and the, um, the paradigms through which people perceive reality. Yeah. And Muslims are really, really behind the ball on this one. It almost feels to me like... The way our ulama and the Muslim leadership is with regard to mass media today in the 21st century, 15th century of Islam, is the way at one time the ulama were with regard to like gunpowder or the printing mm -hmm. press. Printing wow. press. Like they just didn't wow. get it. They didn't get like, yo, the whole world has left us behind. Yeah. And if we don't catch up, we are going to die. Like you're <laughs> dinosaurs right now. Mm -hmm. So wow. that's kind of been happening in our lifetime with respect to mass media because how is it possible that we, as inheritors of the prophetic tradition, out of, out, of one side of our, out of one side of the mouth, honestly and earnestly believe that we are inheritors of a prophetic tradition, and it is our inherited responsibility to share the truth about objective reality with the world. 
that God is real, that, uh, that the messenger of God is truly a prophet, that the final revelation from God is the Quran, which is the preserved word of God, which at its essence and core is the uncreated eternal speech of the divine. And anyway, we have all these profound mystical, metaphysical, and spiritual and religious beliefs to teach the world. And yet, out of the other side of the mouth, the ulama are like, we're not going to use the most common instrumentality through which people are influenced, which is film and television, to deliver right. the message. It makes absolutely zero logical sense to hold it's, that to be your mission in life to propagate the truth and this core set of beliefs and on the other side of the mouth to resist using the very instrumentalities through which people receive their information. People on earth today basically believe whatever they believe about reality based sure. on what they saw on television. Very true. So well, and, 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 and not just – I mean I think what you're saying is actually doubly applicable because right now the number one film in the country is American Sniper. Exactly. And and I mean, without getting into all the complicated politics therein, I mean, there's a specific worldview that that film is espousing, and yes. it's a worldview that's exclusive to a lot of other, right. I would I would argue, reality based views of of that same subject matter. Right. And right. it if you don't think that a film like that plays a very direct role in shaping people's view of uh, their, themselves as Americans and other people as quote unquote foreigners. I mean, you got another thing coming because it's absolutely, it's absolutely an actor upon people's psyches. There's no doubt about that. I mean, by the way, the history of um, you know media and the way modern mass media works and the, the effects it has on perception of perceptions of reality is like a whole field. It's a discipline within academia. People write PhDs on this. Books right. have been written on this. So in that regard, let me give you one brief example that most people don't even know. The Cosby Show, I realize Bill Cosby has now become a pariah and a subject <laughs> of so much public controversy, but putting aside the present controversy surrounding his personal life, the television show, The Cosby Show, when it, in its heyday in the 80s, in the 90s, whatever it was, early 90s, radically affected the perception of black Americans in the psyche of Americans in general. And the proof is in the pudding. So let me give you a couple of data points. Number one, most people don't realize that Bill Cosby has a, a PhD in education from, I think, I think University of Pennsylvania. I, I believe I'm not so. sure where, where he went to school. But he has um, uh, literally a PhD in education. Okay, When he got that show, realized that that was like the fourth or fifth TV show he had been involved in as a co-creator. And so now he knew how the game works. All right, He hired a guy called Dr. Alvin Poussant, who is a Harvard-trained psychologist um, and is a, is a professor of psychiatry or psychology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and he's black American himself. He hired Dr. Poussant to review every script of the Cosby show for the purpose of, quote, recoding blackness in the minds of American viewers. Wow. Hmm. This was a legitimate, deliberate aspect of the script and of every single script on the show and of the TV show itself. Now, did it work? Check this out. Due to Cosby's portrayal of historically black college and universities, HBCUs, constantly showing a middle-class black American family with college-educated professional parents, all the kids being encouraged to go to college, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the real world, applications to HBCUs shot up by over 300%. Wow. That is to say, black Americans' views of themselves and what they were capable of was directly impacted. Now, again, trying to draw a causal relationship is more difficult, but certainly we can argue for a correlation between right. that show and its impact on American pop culture and, by extension, black Americans' perceptions of themselves. So, of course, that would impact not just their own perception of themselves, but also the wider society's perception of black Americans and arguably – uh, Dr. Tucson and Cosby were effective and successful in their effort to, quote, recode blackness in the minds of American viewers. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from that example. Let me Absolutely. give you another example. Let me give you another example. Why is it that we don't really see Indian Muslim terrorists, but we see Pakistani Muslim terrorists all the time? Huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the that's arguments that's been made is Bollywood, one of the arguments that's been made is Bollywood presents back to South Asian males, particularly Indian Muslim males, you know, portrayals by people like Shah Rukh Khan, Amir Khan, plenty of other leading Muslim men 
who who show them who show people a view of themselves which is other than being a violent terrorist. Like, no, we're not terrorists. We're freaking we dance in the park with beautiful women. So once you have a different view of yourself, suddenly the possibilities open up. Whereas Pakistani males, as far as the view of themselves they see on television, as a rule, by and large, is basically media portrayals in the news, which is a bunch of crazy fanatics. Right. That's right. That's right. So and, 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 that and your example of Bollywood, you know, uh, I mean, you mentioned some contemporary examples, but I mean, it goes back to Dilip Kumar, right? I mean, it goes back. Yes. It goes way back. Yes. Yeah. So we're yes. talking decades of yes. Muslims in India being able to see this, you know, see themselves themselves literally on the yes. uh, on the silver screen. Yes. Now, this opens up a more interesting conversation. We started to have this before we, before we started the podcast. Which <laughs> means, what is the difference between those cultures? What is the difference between Islam, the way it lives and breeds in India, versus Islam, the way it sort of lives and breeds in Pakistan, versus Islam, the way it lives and breeds in Saudi Arabia, versus mm-hmm. Turkey, versus Malaysia, versus you know, West Africa, what have you. And I'm convinced more and more that you know, the real conversation that really nobody is having in the public sphere is the fact that there is a legitimate gripe that people like you know, Bill Maher and Sam Harris are trying to articulate, huh. but they're just kind of missing the mark because they're not defining their terms. You know, to attack Islam is foolish because Islam is a great global world tradition. It's a religion that has taken under its banner so many diverse societies, cultures, languages, civilizations, that to attack it as somehow something fundamentally uh, incompatible with the modern age and incompatible with liberalism doesn't really compute. Uh, Islam has proven its ability to square the circles everywhere it's gone and become indigenous in every culture it's, it's touched throughout human history. So it doesn't really stand to reason that uh, their critiques make sense. So when they're saying things like, Sam Harris says, you know, Islam at the moment uh, is the mother load of bad ideas. Huh. Bill, Her- Bill, Bill Maher says, you know, uh, Islam is the only religion that acts like the, the freaking mafia or they'll kill you if, you're wrong, if you draw the wrong cartoon or write the wrong book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is the real passion behind their statement? What are they trying to critique? I would argue, the way I interpret their, their criticisms, they're trying to critique identity Islam. Political Islam, Islam that is basically on one level almost like pornographic. It's all form, no substance. Wow. You know, these people who push political Islam and identity Islam and they've turned Islam into a political movement, into a political identity, into a political party. For them, Islam equals, you know, rallying for the Muslim Brotherhood. And somehow if you critique a doctrine of the Muslim Brotherhood or you don't go to the Palestine rally, somehow you're less of a Muslim. This is identity Islam. It has nothing to do with classical, real, orthodox Sunni Islam that was about balancing, being a balanced human being who has outward reality, that is to say conformity with sacred law, sharia, but also inward reality, which has to do with tasawwuf and haqiqah and ma'rifatullah, spiritual wisdom. If a person is not living in balance, they only have one or the other, in Quranic language, those people are off balance and they're either maghdubi alayhim, they've earned the wrath of God by becoming obsessed with the outward at the expense Correct. of the inward, or they're dalim, they're God. people who have lost their way and they're misguided and astray because all they care about is spirituality with no sacred law. The deen is about being balanced, huh. inward wow. and outward reality. And sadly, on the face of the earth today, there are very few people who even understand the joke, who get the joke that the whole point of life, if you really want to be a person of deen and truly live the values of this religion of Islam, you must commit yourself to a practice not only of outward conformity with the sacred law, learn your fiqh, make your wudu correctly, make your you know ablutions correctly, pray correctly, recite the Quran correctly, etc., 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 but you must also simultaneously commit yourself to a regimen of spiritual practices where you are engaging in daily meditation, where you are making sure that you're not just saying the form of the prayer, but you're actually mindful of where is your heart in the prayer. Mm-hmm. Are you truly with God, or is you, are you, as, as my sheikh likes to say, you know, the whole day we spend, uh, uh, we spend the day in the store, like meaning in our businesses, then we come in the mosque and, stay and fast on and, and stand prepared on the rug, on the prayer rug, and now the, the store is inside of us. Huh. 
Mm-hmm. But all day you're in the store, you stand to pray, and the store is inside you. Wow. That's, right. a, that's a deep meditation on the nature of the modern condition because how many of us can truly say we are able to unplug from the matrix, right. get on the Nebuchadnezzar, and see this thing for what it truly is? <laughs> nice. K- kudos for the, for the Matrix reference. I... <laughs> you know, my, my, my favorite movies are, are Inception, The Matrix, Truman Show, and My Dinner with Andre because all of them are wrestling with the same fundamental question, which is what the Quran is actually all about. You know, are you able to see through the matrix? Do you understand that this dunya, the physical world that you're in, is nothing more than a hyper-realistic virtual reality? Wow. You are basically a character in a video game. It's called dunya. The video game is the world. Huh. And you are, you are playing a video game because you're controlling a character. In your case, you get to control a guy called Zaki Hassan. And uh, Pervez gets to control a guy called Pervez Ahmad. And Azra Osman controls a guy called Azra Osman. But the point is, re- recognize... You don't have to just be the character in the game. You can play the game. Huh. You are an eternal soul, a ruh. Our belief, according to the Quranic understanding of reality, you are actually in control, in charge of steering and controlling your eternal soul, which is not That's limited right. by time or space, which is, according to Quranic language, the divine breath of God that was breathed inside our father Adam, which is why the angels had to bow down to him. They, why do the angels bow down to Adam? Because he is the Khalifa to Allah in Quranic language. He is the he is the basically the representative or the tajalli, the theophany, the manifestation, the, the the outward emanation of the divine reality. That is what man actually is. That's why when people use the problematic language like, you know, Kanye West drops a song, I am a God. You know, what is he actually saying? He's talking about this deep spiritual wisdom that you are not a God capital G. That's but right. you are Khalifa to Allah. You are a representative of God. You are God-like in your essence because your ruh is eternal and it is not limited by time or space. And the divine breath of God is inside you because you are a descendant of Adam. And as a Quranic language, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam, We have ennobled the children of Adam. So there is something deeply mystical, mysterious, spiritual and metaphysical about truly religious teaching which sadly most muslims today don't even know exists in the history of islam let alone are they connected to that teaching in a meaningful connected way that makes that historical reality present and makes it a part of their lives on a day-to-day moment-to-moment basis it's like it's like a dying art in, in religion. So if, if what they're critiquing, if what Sam Harris and Bill Maher are critiquing is identity politics and political Islam and Islamism that all the cares about is form and no substance, all they're obsessed about is establishment of, of a political state and painting the world into black and white, Islamic and un-Islamic, and dividing the, the culture war along these lines of us and them, if that's what they have a problem with, then we're on the same side because those people are crazy. And they have nothing to do with Islam is about nuance. Huh. Islam is about beauty. Islam is about love. Islam is about spirituality, connection with Allah, the Lord and, and creator, the uncreated creator of the universe. We started out in the beginning talking about Paul Provenza. Paul Provenza, for those who may not know, is a comedian who uh, is a legendary comic. He's a comics comic. You know, like for yeah. Muslims to understand who he is, it's like you may have heard of Hamza Yusuf, but you probably don't know Hamza Yusuf's Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Murabit al-Hajj or Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah. You know, they're hidden because they're not public figures in the same way. Sheikh yeah. Hamza Yusuf's destiny was to be a very public, popular, famous teacher. Yeah. But his teacher, uh, you know, is lesser known. But obviously, the fact that he's his teacher shows you his reality. Well, Paul Provenza is like that. He's a comics comic. Wow. Not a lot of not a lot of people know who he is, but you know his fingerprints are all over. Um, you know, a lot of popular ideas. Every comedian worth their salt, you know, has a tremendous amount of respect for this guy. Paul and I started talking very seriously since the summer of 2010 about religion, about God, about spirituality, about uh, you know metaphysics, about um, the, the about science, about reason, about rationality. And through my conversations with him, which were always very intense and very passionate and very, like, unapologetic, unabashed, you know, neither of us holding back, what we, what we came to realize is, first of all, though he calls himself an atheist, um, he has a different definition of atheism 
than most of people and most Muslims certainly understand atheism to be. And he schooled me on his view, which actually resonated with me very deeply, and I would say deeply, deeply impacted my own personal spiritual journey. So this is relevant to the whole conversation, so I'll just share this with you, sure. and then I'll stop talking and let you guys you know, chime in. No, no, please. All, kind of, all of this is kind of setting the stage for, for, I think, where we should take this conversation. He says to me, so are you a believer or are you, uh, are you an atheist? And now keep in mind, I have been a person who was born into a Muslim family, had my own kind of, you know, doubts about religion and God over the years, uh, found finally uh, in my, when I was about 16 years old, uh, discovered the existence of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and then kind of just went all in, like, yo, I believe this thing, but I was still wrestling with my own doubts. And the nature of shaitan, according to, again, Quranic worldview, is that shaitan's job, the devil's job, is to make waswasa, to whisper doubt into your heart. And the way you know that those insinuations, what are called khawatir shaitani, the satanic whispering, how you know it's khawatir shaitani, a satanic whisper or insinuation, is that you start to doubt eternal truth. There are only four, according to classical Sunni Islamic uh, spirituality, uh, Imam al-Muhasibi, one of the great, the early greats, he wrote a book about this, and he basically explains the four types of insinuations that arise in the human heart. Number one, what he calls khawat rabbani the lordly insinuations, which are those insinuations that give you an unbreakable confidence and an unshakable belief, faith in eternal truth. God is real. This world is nothing but an illusion. The prophecy is real. The, the, the scriptures are real. Heaven and hell is real. The judgment is real. Eternal, the eternal soul and the recreation of me into a physical form with eternal punishment and reward, that's all real. When you feel those moments where it's like, yo, man, I know this is true. I have no doubt about it. Those are directly being inspired into your heart from God. And that's called Khawat al-Rabbani or Khawat al-Rahman, the lordly or the merciful, the inspirations of the merciful himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. The second type of inspiration that comes in your heart is your desire to obey God. And that's to, to live a life that's in conformity with righteousness, the moral sacred code of uh, sacred law, um, and the boundaries of your ethical moral compass, which is basically following sharia, sacred law. And when you feel inspired to conform to the law, that's coming from the angels. That's called khawat malakani the angelic whispers. The right. third inspiration that comes is the desire to disobey Allah, to disobey God, to break the commands of God, to just fulfill your own desires even if it means breaking your own moral compass and violating your own spiritual laws. And that's called khawatir nafsani. Those are the egotistical and the lower whisperings of the lower self, the animal self, the selfish self, the ego self. And the fourth whisper that arises is called khawatir shaitani, the demonic whispers, the demonic insinuations. And the way you know that one is because you start to doubt eternal truth. No one had ever taught me this before. So I would deal with all this whisper from the devil and I didn't know where it was coming from and it would really get me, it would mess with my heart all the time. So, since I was a kid. I remember I used to go to Sunday school, man, lie, lie awake late at night. Like I was, must have been seven or eight years old. And I would just be like, man, these guys at Sunday school, these teachers are telling me that there's a day of judgment and there's heaven and hell forever. If that is real... What the hell are we all doing? Like, <laughs> life is so absurd and meaningless. Like, why do I have to study for an exam and go to school tomorrow and wake up and like, this is so stupid and dumb. What are we doing? Like, this makes zero sense to me because there's eternity waiting for us. Why are we not obsessed with just preparing for eternity 24-7? Why do I have to freaking eat spinach and, like, eat my vegetables and <laughs> care about getting good grades and go to school? Like, it's so retarded. It makes zero logical sense if – the spiritual things I'm being told are actually true, then we, our whole lives are completely a farce because we do not live our lives in a way that is indicative of the fact that these things are actually true. So either they're not true or we're a bunch of hypocrites. Both of those are bad options. So I'm going to go with, I don't really know what the hell is going on here. <laughs> I was riddled with doubts, man. I was riddled with massive doubts. So fast forward, 2010, summer, I'm in L.A. I meet Paul Provenza outside the comedy store. Now, mind you, at this point, I've had a sheikh for 10 years almost, but I didn't really get it. 
And at this point, I've been, you know, with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf since 1995, 1994, when I first met him. But I didn't really get it. I didn't wow. understand what the whole thing is about. I understood a lot of it intellectually, but it didn't really hit my heart, you know, up to that point. All right. So Paul Provenza and I are talking, very furious conversation. He says to me, so are you a believer or are you an atheist? I said, oh, I'm definitely not an atheist. I said, if anything, maybe I would have copped to being an, an agnostic because I have a lot of doubts about this stuff, but I'm battling those doubts. I really do believe this stuff sometimes, but I don't really know, man. He says, to me, an agnostic is just an atheist who doesn't have the balls to admit it. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, look, how do you define atheism? How do you define agnosticism? I said, to me, an atheist is a person who holds an affirmative belief in the non-existence of a supreme being. So in other words, an atheist takes a position and says, God does not exist. That's what they actually believe affirmatively. Sure. Whereas, whereas an agnostic is just not sure. He says, I don't know. Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God. I don't take any position on it. I'm not sure. And a believer, just to round out the three categories, is somebody who takes an affirmative position and says, I do believe God exists. Okay. Right. He says, I think that that's not an accurate representation of the truth. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, all of religion, all of spirituality, all of wisdom tradition that is based on, you know, that is a theocentric teaching, if you boil it all down, it's really one single proposition. And that proposition is God exists. God is. Right? It's an affirmative claim. In Quranic language, it would be, Am I not your Lord? That's the one proposition. That's the one question posited to man. God, according to the Quran, assembles all of human beings, all human souls, in one magical, mystical, miraculous, metaphysical reality, in a, in a time outside of time, in a place outside of space. All of us are assembled there together. It is the, you know, Bazmi uh, Alast, according to Maulana Rumi, the party of Alast. And we're all there together. And then God poses the cosmic question, which is the ground of existence itself, and he says to human beings, am I not your Lord? That's right. And according to the Quran, every human soul individually testified, Bala shahidna, indeed, truly you are, we have witnessed it. Okay. So Preventa says to me, that's the single proposition of all of religion. God exists. And he said, you're, you have to respond to it now. You're a human being. You're offered this proposition. You have to respond to this proposition. The response you can have is binary. Either you believe it, you assent to it. We would call that in Quranic language, Iman, Iqrarun bil lisani wa tasdikun bil qalb. You testify with your tongue and you affirm it, believing it in your heart with conviction. So that's one response. You believe it. Or, option number two, you don't. That's it. Whatever your reasons are, you're not sure, uh, it's confusing, it's all BS, it's all made up fairy tales, and you know people are arguing about stuff that people are made up hundreds of years ago, the way, Quran, the way the Quran describes it, you know, Asatir al these are just stories of the ancients, people made this stuff up, exactly the way Chris Rock talks about you know, the Quran and the Bible, ah, people just wrote this stuff hundreds of years ago, it's just made up stuff. So this is the old argument that opponents of religion have made, throughout all of human history, according to the Qur'an, and the Qur'an's very bold claim is that we already know they're going to do this to the Qur'an as well, and that's why Allah puts over and over again, God puts over and over again challenges, puts forth challenges in the Qur'an. If you really doubt this is from God, haven't you pondered this? Haven't you hmm. considered that? How is it possible that this thing is totally consistent? It has no internal inaccuracies and, and inconsistencies. Uh, have you not pondered that, you know, how is it possible? This is not, not the word of God. Why, why don't you try to create one chapter like it? Create one verse like it. And that's a pretty bold challenge. Create one verse like this book. What's really fascinating to me is atheists who want to deny or doubt uh, the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. God bless him and keep him. They have to wrestle with the fact that even in his own lifetime, his own opponents and detractors and enemies did not just dismiss him as nothing. They had to take a position about this guy because they were like, look, and their only options were like, either he's the greatest magician from the east to the west, he's a demon-inspired, you know, human devil, God forbid, right? But that was a, another popular explanation. He is uh, just involved in some sort of sorcery 
or he's crazy. He's involved in, he's possessed by some sort of spirit and he's out of his mind. But notice that all the explanations are supernatural explanations, paranormal phenomena. Why? Because you cannot just dismiss this Quran. The Quran is a logical, rational rechallenge to human reason. You cannot just dismiss this thing as if it's nothing. If you want to be internally consistent and be a rational, reasonable person, you have to wrestle with the fact that the Quran presents some pretty inexplicable phenomena. How is this book the only book on earth that has 14 centuries of a chain of custody that is indisputed and, un- and verifiable? You can literally pick up a copy of this text on any corner of the, of the earth in Arabic language, every letter, every sound, every vowel, and trace it to the oldest extant copies, which are at this point 14 centuries old, and there's not a single letter. There's no other book on earth like that. Find me a copy of the Vedas or the Bible or the Torah or the, or the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tse or the writings of the Buddha or the teachings of the – find me anything that's even close. Not a <laughs> single scripture on earth even makes that claim. So it's like you want to be reasonable and rational and intellectual, I, I'm all for it, man. But please reconcile this, this incredible phenomenon. And if you want to continue to doubt the content of this book, at least admit that it has this miraculous feature that you cannot explain. So all of this is to say Paul Provenza scared the hell out of me. <laughs> because I was like, yo, man, he's right, you know. And the Quran actually adopts a very similar construct because the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the very beginning of the, of the book, uh, of the scripture, in the, in the story of the cow, the, the, the chapter of the cow, Al-Baqarah, God Almighty sets up the categories. And his argue, his, his, his framework of reality is, look, all human beings with all the subtlety and difference of opinion between them, all the shades of gray and the rainbow of, of, of spectrum of human possibilities, in the end of the day, when you die and you stand before God, there is a binary outcome. Hmm. Either you fall into the first category, which is called mu'min, believer, mm-hmm. You fall into the second category, which is a rejecter, which is kafir. Or the only third option that it uh, it allows for is called munafir, a hypocrite, which is basically in reality a kafir, a disbeliever, who was just pretending to be a believer. But ultimately, it all folds into two categories, which is why the binary ultimate outcome of salvation and damnation of heaven and hell is a universal construct across all religion and all wisdom tradition, because Provenza is right. It is a single proposition you have to respond to, and it is a binary binary outcome. You either believe it or you don't believe it. And when he put he put the fear of God in my heart, man, because I was like, yo, if I was gun to the gun to my head right now, if someone said, you know, do you really believe this thing? Are you willing yeah. to die for it? Are you willing to die for it? Are you willing to kill for it? That's the crazier thing, right? Gandhi mm-hmm. once said, I met a lot of I met a lot of causes I'd be willing to die for. I've right. never come across a cause I'd be willing to kill for. Huh. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that scared the hell out of me, bro. I'm not going to lie to you. And it was later that year that a series of very, very, unbelie- for me, unbelievable and amazing spiritual things happened that basically, alhamdulillah, I mean, all praise and thanks to God, uh, chased away that doubt in a way that uh, I never experienced before in my life. And uh, let me just share one detail on that. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who has played a very uh, pivotal role in my life, uh, I ended up seeing him later that year maybe a, a month or two after I had this conversation with Provenza. And I could, this is in London. He was doing that event with uh, Tariq Ramadan at, at I think Oxford or Cambridge, Oxford. something like that. At Oxford. That's right. Mm-hmm. I was there that night, so I ended up attending the event. Oh, so, wow. You know, so, I, alhamdulillah, I mean, uh, one of the greatest blessings in my life is just the fact that somebody like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf even knows who I am and, and, and <laughs> loves me and considers me you know, a, a friend. So he said, you know, hey, come back to the hotel. Let's hang out. So we're hanging out that night, and he, he wants to go back to uh, Heathrow because he has a flight out the next morning. So we roll in a car from whatever, Oxford to Heathrow. Where we have like an hour, two hours in the car. It's just him, him and me in the back seat and the, the brother who was driving the car. So he says, well, how are you doing? Are you all right? And I was like, no, I'm not all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm horrible. And he said, what's going on? I said, yo, man, I feel like one minute I'm a Muslim and the next minute I'm a Kafir. And I feel that Iman goes in and out of me, like, on a daily basis. And I, I'm dancing on the edge of my existence 24-7. And if God takes me at any moment in time, I have no idea if I'm going to burn in hell forever or if I'm going to be confident among the believers. Mm. Like Hanzal is predictive. Mm. And, he lo- and he looks me dead in the eye, bro. And he says, do you know who Ibn Wahbin is? I said, no, who's that? 
He said, Ibn Wahbin, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa rahmatullahi alayhi, God have mercy on his eternal soul. He is a great scholar of hadith. He took hadith from Imam Shafi'i. He's one of the students of Imam Shafi'i. Who is, for those who don't know, like, you know, the Oliver Wendell Holmes of Islam. He's like a very, very towering intellectual figure in the codification of sacred law for Sunni Islam. So Ibn Wahbin said, you know, thank God for Imam Shafi'i. By the way, I don't want to screw this up. Either it was Imam Shafi'i or it might, it might have been Imam Malik. I'm like 90% sure it was Imam Shafi'i, it might have been Imam Malik. But it was one of the eponymous founders of, uh, of a school of Sunni sacred law, one of the four schools. Mm-hmm. So Ibn Wahbin says, thank God for you know, Imam Shafi'i or Imam Malik. He said, because before he codified these hadith sciences... He says, I was riddled with doubts, and one day my heart would waver, and I would find myself in Iman, and the next day it would waver, and I'd find myself outside of Iman. In other words, one day I'd find myself a believer, one day I'd find myself a disbeliever. Hmm. Now keep in mind, this is Ibn Wahbin, a guy who is a towering figure, universally respected, considered what's called thiqqa, totally reliable narrator of sacred uh, prophetic narrations and traditions in the history of Islamic law. And this is a guy who's admitting to having the same problem I was having, only having it 1,300 years before me. Wow. So that was very comforting to my heart. And then Sheikh Hamza actually did something. I mean, this is like one of these things that you only get uh, to have if, if, if God blesses you, man. But he did mm-hmm. something to me. And needless to say, uh, I felt like he chased the demon away that had been whispering fun- fundamental doubts in my heart for, at that point, 30-plus years. 35 years at that point. I mean, that was Jeez. four years ago. I'm 39 right now. Wow. So it, it was very, and then of course after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is very merciful, man. So, you know, if you really want to, you know, because faith is both a choice and a miracle. It is like existence itself. It is a paradoxical, mysterious commingling of the human will and the will of God. Mm. So you have to want to believe in God to receive the divine gift of faith. But you have to want to be guided. You have to want to believe it. And if you stop caring about it and you just give up or you don't care or you're like whatever or it's all you know fairy tales and you know, high, tall tales some people made up a long time ago. And Yeah, religion sounds kind of cool, but it's basically crowd control. It's the opiate of the masses. It's just you know, a bunch of made-up garbage. And why are people fighting so much? This is like, these are very common atheistic, agnostic, skeptical notions that have become the dominant philosophical underpinnings of the modern age. That's right. And they're so pervasive. They're so pervasive. They're like air. We don't see them, but we don't see that they're part of what keeps us alive. Part yeah. of what sustains the modern world and its ability to divorce people from reality, so that so that a country like America could be simultaneously uh, engaged in lecturing the world about terrorism and political violence and trying to shame other societies into being more responsible with their violence, and yet be committing more violent atrocities than perhaps any other empire in human history. It's a weird weird existence. It's a weird existence. And somehow we're all just lulled into this dream state where we don't question it. Like We unquestionably believe that America has moral authority to question other people about nuclear weaponry and nuclear atom bombs when America is the only country in human history to drop atom bombs on a civilian population. It makes absolutely no logical sense. <laughs> so these paradoxes are confronting us time and time again. And yet we're just in a dream state. We're lulled to sleep, as the Prophet put it. You know, human beings are asleep. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nasu niyam. People are asleep. They're just, they're just walking through life in a dream state. Right. And when they die... They then they up. wake up. Right. So the Quran uses this metaphor over and over of being in a sleep state, being in a dream-like state. When people are resurrected on the day of judgment, they're talking to each other. Like, yo, how long were we in the earth? Oh, man, it was like half a day, a day. It feels like it was a dream, right? It was a dream. And by the way, this is really amazing because we have all learned this since we were children, bro. The, the Sufis often use the metaphor of existence itself being this oceanic type of uh, illusion and your little body that you're given to be in this little 
in, individuation, this instantiation of a of an identity, of a self, right? What Carl Jung called the process of individuation. You become a conscious individual ego with an identity and a boundary of self that is a consciousness that is individually you and you really start to believe in this idea that oh I'm Zaki Hassan I'm Parvez Ahmed I'm Azur Asman I'm I'm somebody I'm an individual and I have my own thoughts and feelings and ideas and identity and this me 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 which is all ego it's all nafs it's all driven by an illusion of ego that I am somebody I am mm-hmm. something right whether whereas the Sufis have taught us you know the Sufi tradition teaches us that to say I am something or I am nothing are both statements of fools. <laughs> because they're both driven from ego. I am something or I am nothing. Because the problem with both of them is they both still have the problem there, which is I. So the, uh, the awliya Allah, the saints have taught us that to say I am something or I am nothing are both foolish statements of the ego. The true believer remains silent. And if he must speak, all he says is Allah. That's all that's real. That's all that is actually independent of being, is Allah. And everything other than it is an illusion. In the words of Abu Hassan al-Shadili, rahimahullah, one of the greatest, greatest walis of, of God, he said, the Sufi sees his own existence like particles of dust made visible by a ray of sunlight, neither real nor unreal. Mm. <laughs> La ilaha illallah. You're just dancing on the edge of your existence and understanding and comprehending and witnessing with your not with your eye of your of, in your in your face with the eye of the heart mm-hmm. in the state of what's called mutahada spiritual witnessing you're seeing that man this whole illusion is just a matrix none of this none of this crap is real ya'lamu annama al-hayat ad-dunya la'ibun wa lahwun wa zinatun wa tafakhurun baynakum wa takathurun fil amwal wa al-awlad God summarizes the entire world, life of this world, in literally, literally, what we today, what we today would regard to be the sections of a newspaper. <laughs> he says, "Where is the world? Know this, know this thing. What is the life of this world? Illa except for playing around games. We've got that sports nowadays, or video games, gaming. Okay, vain talk, which is basically Man. new." News and and just you know chatter, talking heads. Right? <laughs> Turn on 24-hour news. It's just it's just love It's just now we have a new story and now we have ten guys talking about the new story and we have a comment. Now we have ten guys talking about a comment that was made by one of the guys on the news story and now we have a controversy that's wrong about a statement that was made. What the hell are you guys talking about? It's, <laughs> it's just vaporware. It's vaporware. It's manufactured reality that has nothing to do with ultimate reality and everything to do with distracting you from what's really happening. It's bread and circus, right? The Roman Empire created bread and circus, which nowadays is called McDonald's in Hollywood. As long as you just keep the people fed and entertained, the empire can do whatever the hell it wants to do. Right. Are you not entertained? Yeah. So, <laughs> we would call that nowadays fashion, right? Beauty. Right. The section of the newspaper. And by the way, Zinatun also has a relationship to pornography. Pornography nowadays is perhaps the most pervasive form of this Zina. Just beauty, unrestricted, and the Pandora's uh, box is open, the genie is out of the bottle, and people are obsessed with the physical form of the, the naked body. And because it is so naturally occurring, it's a shahwa, a lustful passion is a naturally occurring human reality. When you in, when you indulge it in a completely morally irresponsible manner, divorced completely from any notion of sacred law, then you un, you unleash onto the world what has happened now, which is basically a complete destruction of love, and uh, and replace replacing love with lust. You know, so huh. so nowadays, like even people getting married, they don't really get married for love; they're getting married for lust. And their secret hope and desire is they're going to have some kind of porn star sex, you know, on their wedding night. This is a sickness. This is, these are all spiritual sicknesses that actually tasawwuf, spirituality, Sufism, exists to help us rid ourselves of so we can actually become truly human. And, and gossip and, and, and competing with one another. We would call that nowadays celebrity gossip. <laughs> competing with one another with respect to money, which is basically finance, right. <laughs> in regard to children, which children. is basically 
society. Mm-hmm. That is literally the sections of a newspaper. Bro. So the Quran has summed up this whole life is a bunch of distractions. If you're not distracted by the Super Bowl, if you're distracted by the stock market, if you're not distracted by the stock market, you're distracted by pornography. If you're not distracted by pornography, you're distracted by fashion and clothing and purses and designers and your portfolio and the news and international politics. And it, just, it never ends. Yeah. It's all noise. And all of it is designed like the Matrix to distract you from the ultimate reality, which is what you are going to die one day. You're going to go in a hole in the ground. What happens then? And how many brain cells have you dedicated to thinking about that? <laughs> you know, I, I, in, just in an indication of how deep Uzzer is, I, I think this conversation started with me saying, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Well, I was going to say, you know, we, we've talked a lot about paradoxes uh, and, and, and just shifting realities. But, you know, we probably had the most sort of serious conversation uh, on, 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 on and, and, and commentary on metaphysics and, and, and ultimate realities uh, from a comedian. Who, who we, or at least our intention was to have a comedian on the show, you know, so well, sir, there, my- therein lies the paradox itself. Well, one of one of my favorite uh, humorists is a guy called Sir Peter Ustinov. Right, he was a two-time uh-huh. sure, sure. Yeah. actor. And right. The polymyth. The guy was amazing, playwright, right. actor, you know, music. Sir Peter Ustinov said, "Comedy is just a funny way of being serious." <laughs> right. <laughs> well, he also said one of my that. favorite quotes. He also said one of my favorite political quotes when he said, uh, uh, "Terrorism is the war of the poor." And war is terrorism of the rich. That's right. right. Nice. Wow. So, so let me ask. I mean, there's just so much to unpack there, and obviously, we're not going to have time to even maybe scratch the surface. Uh, but I think one of the things, that, or among among the many things that I was thinking about while you were talking, was you know, you talked you talked about the state of the modern Muslim world, and and maybe bringing it even home closer to home, like here in America. Um, what do you attribute the sort of rise of what you have, what you have, I think, very uh, aptly um, uh, termed identity Islam, uh, and the almost, uh, you know, the lack of this sort of deep spiritual tradition that, as you mentioned again, uh, for over a millennia, uh, you know, was the the hallmark of Islam? Millennium. Millennium. That's right. Sorry, I pluralized it. Yeah. Um, that is that is the billion dollar question, my friend. That is the billion dollar question. I mean, we all have our theories. Yeah. Uh, I think there's no doubt. I think there's no doubt that. Okay, look. Let, let's let's have let's divide this conversation into two parts. Mm-hmm. The starting point of which, for both parts, is the fact that we, if we're going to be totally honest, and of course Muslims behind closed doors are honest about the fact that there is a real crisis. Right. Uh, of authority in the religion itself. Okay. You know, one of the great one of the great paradoxes of Islam is the fact that um, uh, one of its great uh, and and most um, uh, attractive salient features is that fact that it has no clergy, it has no closed authoritarian structure that has right. a top down approach of a couple of guys vested with some kind of magical authority to then like the Pope who just decides what the teaching of Christ is and then he just forces it on everybody. We don't have that in Islam. So I mean, for great. me, if we're being nuanced, side, if we're being nuanced, I'm saying that's, I mean, you know, that is more demonstrative within the Sunni tradition. Fair, fair enough. Yes, fair enough. But, but again, keep in mind that even among uh, the Shia tradition, I'm not super well versed on this, but there are different types of Shia um, strands. And Correct. yes, there's an imam right. principle, but there's still a respect for ilm. And there is an idea of you have to study and master certain sciences to become an ayatollah or to become a qualified scholar who then is vested with the authority to, to interpret the source text of the religion. There is, a, there is an acknowledgement of this reality that not just anybody can you know, inherit or uh, mm-hmm. claim to speak in the name of Islam without being properly qualified. There is a value Absolutely. placed Absolutely. on being qualified, paying your dues and mastering certain sciences. So there's this egalitarian type of concept, but it's no doubt your your point is well taken. Sunni Islam, this is this is the hallmark of Sunni Islam, mm-hmm, is that mm-hmm. it completely takes away, takes interpretation of of scholarly texts 
and the source text of the religion outside the domain of just a bunch of specialized, you know, mystical, miraculous people and puts it in the hands of anybody who studies this tradition and becomes a true master, if they get the respect of their peers, they can interpret this, this source text of the religion and basically operationalize it and tell people how they should be implementing these teachings. So Absolutely. this tension is implicit in the religion itself. Now, mm-hmm. On the one hand, we don't have top-down authoritarian structure. On the other hand, people that, that leaves us open and susceptible to problems if a crisis emerges where it's not clear who does have the authority to interpret the source text of Islam. So that's the starting point of this conversation. Who has the authority to authoritatively interpret the source text of Islam and define the parameters of what is quote-unquote orthodoxy? Who has that authority? Okay, And in the modern time, when I say there's two parts of the conversation, the problem is that there are external reasons, that is to say, problems that you know, we did not create, Muslims did not create, and then there are internal reasons. There are problems for which, if we're going to be honest, we are certainly partly responsible. The external reasons have to do with, obviously, colonialism, the complete destruction of traditional Muslim societies through brute force and invasion by foreign occupiers, part of which came with the destruction of traditional societies, values, systems of education, you know, uh, institutions of education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, slowly divorcing Muslims and Muslim societies from their own classical and traditional orthodox understanding of themselves. And institutions. If you can create if you, and, and institutions. If you can create a people who become divorced from their own understanding of themselves, mm-hmm. the way they have understood and related to these source texts for hundreds of years, then you've commit you've, you've you're actually able to to uh, commit an amazing, achieve an amazing a- a outcome, which is now you get to decide what are those people, how are those people going to see themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that there is definitely something to be said for those external invading, occupying forces. Which, not to get into conspiracy theories, but obviously it's open. It's no secret. It's an open secret that those forces often were devout, open enemies of Islam. And why, what, what, what fueled their, their hatred of Islam or their, their anger with Islam or their, their um, jealousy, quite frankly, of Islam? You know, this is also, also a very important, interesting note to, to note. People often frame um, the Crusades and uh, the historical wars between Islam and Christendom as though the, what was the fuel behind those wars was hatred based on Muslims are so different from Christians, right? The popular myth nowadays perpetuated in the popular American discourse, movies like American Sniper, etc., is somehow that Muslims are so foreign, Muslims are so weird, they look different, they talk different, they, they, pray to, they don't pray to God, they pray to Allah, an Arabic God, they're the moon God. So all this constant uh, painting of Muslims as if they're weird and different and other, and they're so unrelatable to Western Christendom. This is the popular notion and myth of, of, moder- of modernism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. However, however, history has taught us, and there's a great book on this by, by Richard Bullitt called uh, The Case for Islamo-Christian Civilization. Right. And he's a historian from Columbia University, very, very qualified to comment on this uh, in his field. And he says, no, that's not true at all. He said, if you actually look at the history of the relationship between Islam and Christendom, Christian Europe did not find Islam to be weird and different on the contrary, Christian Europe found Islam to be way too close for comfort. That's right. That's this, is right. A rival, this is a rival civilization right. that has literally taken over Sicily, has taken over Spain, is knocking at the doors of the, you know, according to some historians, the Parthenon in Greece, in Greece was at one right. time an operating mosque. The Pope was paying jizya, the, the, the tax, to the caliph. Okay? So this was a radically different time of human history where Christianity as the dominant civilizational force ruling Europe felt Islam knocking at the door about to take over all of Europe. So it was not that Islam was so different and weird. On the contrary, it was that Islam is about to beat us at our own game and become the civilizational force uh, that will take over Europe. So that's that's the early beginnings, you could say, 
of now trying to otherize Islam and Muslims, trying to paint them as the enemy, trying to create conflict where there was no historical conflict. Now, of course, there was always been some political, you know, uh, there's been political realities on the ground. I think this is an important mistake to avoid. A lot of Muslims get into whitewashing our own history. You know, the, Muslim, the history of Islamic empires and Islamic political history is nothing more than the history of the Muslim ego. And Muslims are human beings like everybody else. They've engaged in empire building like everybody else. They've mm-hmm. committed human mm-hmm. atrocities like everybody else. They have killed and pillaged and plundered like everybody else. They were yeah. motivated by money and power and, and, uh, and, and, and found women and, and, and booty as intoxicating. I don't mean booty in a sexual way, reference. They found a booty of war and spoils, yeah, of, spoils war. of war. Yeah. Yeah, intoxicating and irresistible like everybody else. So this is also part of our history. We should not get into the business of trying to justify every act ever done by a Muslim because we just look stupid and idiotic, and none of our ulama actually did that. Imam al-Ghazali actually goes off on the ulama who try to do that kind of stuff and says, you know, please stop. You guys are doing a disservice to the religion of Islam. Stop commenting on, on fuels of knowledge that you don't know anything about. Stop talking about philosophy and about science and reason and rationality when you haven't studied this stuff because you look stupid and you, you hurt Islam by making stupid statements that, that you, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And that's mm-hmm. basically the same thing happening today. There's a lot of people who are, for lack of a better word, Mulvis or Molanas, with no disrespect to the real ulama who have truly mastered the sciences of, of religion. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people running around who are basically clowns who have you know, sat through a madrasa for you know, five to ten years and because they're given a certificate... And if people now give them the title, give them now a title of, a, and I, I know, Allah, God forgive me if I'm out of line making these criticism. I'm nobody to critique somebody who's even done that, sitting in a madrasa five to ten years, and and even just reading those books and studying them. They're way beyond, above and beyond anything I've accomplished in my life, and that's not some kind of false humility. That's true, and and they should stop commenting on on fields of knowledge that they don't know anything about because they're actually hurting the religion. They end up looking stupid and making Islam and Islamic scholarship look stupid. So that's a very common problem. And that starts getting into, into the second part of this conversation. You mentioned what, what are the reasons for it. How do we get, end up in this predicament? So we've talked about the external forces, the colonization of Muslim lands, the destruction of traditional Muslim uh, methods of education, the transference of knowledge, the preservation of traditional... Uh, you know, by the way, the word tradition in the English language, comes from the Latin word traditio, which means to hand down. So we believe in the idea of handed down knowledge, tracing any knowledge that we take to be authentic as knowledge that was traceable and has a chain of custody and a, tra- and a transmission uh, linking us back to wherever that knowledge came from. Right. And if somebody comes with knowledge that they claim to be religious knowledge that doesn't have that backing it up, we treat it with tremendous amount of suspicion. That's right. So now this is getting us into the second, the second bucket here. What, what are the problems that we have internally? The biggest problem, of course, is the fact that we have distanced ourselves from the most tried and true methods of how we relate to the source text of the religion, which is through the methodology of consistency and verification of source text, verification of knowledge, and only taking knowledge from people who are truly qualified to give that knowledge. The moment we create a free for all, and anybody with the uh, access to Google and uh, and uh, who can now get the Quran and get uh, you know all the source texts of the Quran you know off Google, and now everybody who can do that thinks that they're justified and empowered and have a right to chime in and and give their opinion and they should be taken seriously because because I wrote a a Facebook post about this and I studied some Hadith and Quran, you should take me seriously. No, you are an idiot. You are not to be taken seriously. You are part of the problem who is contributing toward the destruction of the very thing that we believe to be the foundation of consistency of this religion. Think about this. Sunni Islam was able to be a miraculously preserved and consistent, internally consistent and intellectually coherent tradition for about a thousand years because the boundaries of discussion and debate were agreed upon the framework for what is orthodox and what is heterodox was established. The hermeneutical framework was, was argued, debated, and established. And once, you, once those boundaries were set, there are four paths or schools that belong to these, that, that, that fit within this framework, and they all had a mutually exclusive, uh, sorry, they all had a mutually uh, respectful relationship with one another, where it's like, yo, you can belong to any of these four, you follow any of them consistently, 
You know, we got no problem with you. You got no problem with us. We pray behind you. You pray behind us. We marry you. You marry us. We eat your meat. You eat our meat. We are basically, we belong to the same understanding of religion. We just differ on certain details of how to interpret things. And that allows for a multiplicity of opinions, all of which are acceptable because Islam is not the path that is straight and narrow. Islam is the path that is straight and wide. Okay? So that means for about a thousand years, there are four acceptable methods that you can relate to this source text of religion on the level of sacred law through any of these four. What the modern age has done by unleashing this erroneous and false perception of reality that anybody who can read these source texts is now self-empowered to interpret the text on their own mm -hmm. has allowed for the billion, for a billion schools of law to emerge. Right. There's a billion Muslims on earth that each of whom believes that he has every right to read the Quran and Hadith traditions and basically work it out on the, by themselves. That's right. If that's not, you know, as, 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 as Abdul Hakim Murad called it, you know, uh, T.J. Winter, he said, if, if no, perhaps no more brilliant a scheme for the destruction of advice. Uh, for the, he says, perhaps no more brilliant a scheme for the destruction of Islam could ever have been devised. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. So that's one big part of the problem. Now, the second right. part is what we talked about earlier, that there's no spirituality. Right. We are people have, who have gone towards the Maghdubi alayhim side. You know, mm -hmm. the Quran gives a framework. The Quran gives an archetypal framework. People end up being either maghdubi alayhim, they earn the, the wrath of God. Why? Because they become extreme in their exoterism. All they right. care about is religious laws and following the laws and do's and don'ts, halal and haram, black and white, Islamic, un-Islamic. All they talk about is, is, is legalistic discourse. And all they care about is following a bunch, a bunch of laws. Well, those people are maghdubi alayhim mm -hmm. because they have obsessed over the outward at the expense of the inward. Correct. Those people are imbalanced, and they're not people. They, they are people, according to Imam Malik, that become sinners. Whereas the second category, what a dalin, are people who are archetypally the Christian community. The first one is archetypally the Jewish community because they became a very legalistic tradition that was obsessed with Mosaic law, Talmudic, Torahic law, and they have the Torah and the Talmud, and they have like all these rabbis just like dissecting rules and the rules about the rules and debating the rules and the exceptions to the rules about the rules. And it's like they have lost the spirituality along the way and became a community obsessed with laws. The opposite extreme is what happened with Christianity, the path that the, the, the followers of, of Jesus, peace and blessings of God uh, on his eternal soul. He ended up producing a community of followers who ended up growing extreme the other way. All they emphasize is just love and, you know, just, you'll hear Christians, Christians say this all the time, right? Just take Jesus into your heart and just love God and take Jesus as your Savior and you don't have to do anything. You could be in the club Saturday night, getting drunk, having, you know, sex all night and then wake up in the morning. Don't even go to church, just, you know, repent in your heart or think about Jesus or go to church and confess your sins and it's all fine. So you don't have to do anything. You know, there's no, there's no sacred law. So this is the, according to the Islamic framework, the Quranic framework, this is the opposite extreme. Becoming right. so close with the inward that you completely divorce yourself from the outward. No moral responsibility. And Islam as the middle path is a path that is attempting to teach humanity how to balance the inward with the outward. Become a community of sacred law, but also deep spirituality and wisdom. Huh. And of course, bridging the gap between those two having correct understanding intellectually of the divine reality, which is the field of aqidah. So for Muslims who are listening, this ends up kind of breaking down along the lines of the first one is law, which is sharia, which is codified into a field called fiqh, positive law. And the way mm -hmm. we follow the fiqh is we follow the madahib, the schools of Islamic law, which is the four methodologies or legal schools of jurisprudential interpretation. The second field is aqidah, which is correct creed or theology, and regarding that, the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, Sunni Islam, developed two schools, the Ash'ari and the Maturidi schools, which are the orthodox methods of making sure you ensure correct understanding of divine realities and right. uh, prophetic and, and all the, the, the core beliefs of, of a Muslim. And then the third dimension, which is the realm of, the, if the first one is the realm of the body, the second one is the realm of the mind, right. the third one is the realm of the heart and the spirit and the soul, which is, of course, the, 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 the ruh and the heart, the qalb, 
and the field that you did rules that is called tasawwuf and the way uh, Sufism or spirituality or known by many names in the tradition it's known as the, as tazkiyah to nafs the purification of the ego riyadh to nafs the disciplining or taming of the ego it's known as ihsan spiritual beauty it's known as tasawwuf you know Sufism it's known as um, you know um, uh, what's another word that they use in the tradition you know it's known by a lot of beautiful names it's known as yeah ihsan in the in the famous uh, I was going to say Islam, Iman, Ihsan, which you're also defining. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Islam, Iman, Ihsan are the three vectors in the famous Gabriel Hadith. Again, mm-hmm. back to what we just said, the first laws is Islam, uh, Iman is creed and theology, and Ihsan is spirituality and, and wisdom teaching, which is, again, purification of the heart. Right. Uh, um, the fighting the Amrad al-Qalb, the diseases of the heart. So, Tazkiyat um, al-Nafs and Tazfiyat al-Qalb. Another name of this discipline is the purification of the heart, or the cleansing of the heart. So this wisdom tradition, which is the domain traditionally of tasawwuf, the Sufis, has also become a dirty word right. in Muslim communities today. Right. So if you want to diagnose the problem correctly, what the hell is wrong with us today? Maybe it's because we've, closed, we've turned our backs on the entire body of wisdom tradition within Islam that produced such giants as Imam al-Ghazali and Maulana Rumi and Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani and uh, you know all of the great mashayikh of the Sawaf, Sheikh uh, Bahauddin Naqshbandi, Sheikh Muinuddin Tishti, Sheikh uh, you know uh, Abu Bakr al-Suhrawardi, Sheikh uh, you know Maulana Rumi, and the, one of the, probably the greatest example because universally regarded by ulama and mashayikh people of the outward sciences of religion and the inward sciences of spirituality, to be the man who wrote the Mathanawi al-Ma'anawi, commonly referred to as the Quran in Persian. You're telling me a guy who was so gifted and blessed by God that he was able to decode the meanings of the Quran at such an esoteric level and then write deeply intoxicating spiritual poetry in the Persian language that became commonly known as the Quran in Persian. You're telling me this guy who is universally associated with the word Sufi. You can't talk about Maulana Rumi without calling him a Sufi. Huh. And somehow right. we're supposed to flush all that down the toilet because these, not, these crazy you know, identity Muslims and these people who call themselves by a lot of names, Ahl Hadith or Su- Salafis. Wahhabi, Salafi, right. right. Yeah. Now, I don't want to conflate Wahhabism and Salafism because there is Correct. a distinction and there, there was a relationship there, but... You know, we have to get into some more. This is where the rubber meets the road and the gray areas start to emerge. But right. all of these phenomena are part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And we are all lying and pretending when we're tra- we act as if we're talking about the problem. We are not talking about the elephant in the room. The elephant right. in the room is that you still cannot. Is there a problem in America? Is there a problem in, Muslim, in the Muslim community in the West? Hell yeah, there's a problem in the Muslim, Muslim community in the West. You cannot go into 99% of massage in, uh, in America and just have a public dhikr. For example, in the way Sunni Muslims traditionally for a thousand years would after Friday prayer hold a public dhikr that was led by a sheikh and they would recite some, you know, uh, some litanies together. They might sing some songs in praise of the prophet. You can't do it anymore. You will be shut down by the mosque board who, in my terminology, those people are unconscious fundamentalists. <laughs> because they, they don't even know what they're, where they're coming from. They'll just tell you, brother, this is bid'ah, this is haram, this is shirk. And they want to shut you down, and they have no idea where that's coming from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So where is that coming from? It's coming from a poisoned notion of Islam that is ideological Islam, that is identity Islam, that is identity politics Islam, that is political Islam, that has nothing to do with the actual orthodox classical Sunni tradition that equally respects the outward sciences and the masters of the outward sciences of religion who are called the ulama and universally accepts and respects the masters of the inward sciences of Islam who are called the Mashaykh as sufiya mm-hmm. And by the way, people will quote Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, may God have mercy on him. They'll quote Ibn Tayyim al-Jawziyyah as their proponents and exponents of their so-called Salafi nonsense. These people are not, these people are not proponents of anti tasawwuf On the contrary, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah himself, in his list of who the Majadid scholars were, who are the great revivers and the greatest uh, leaders of Islam in the Immatul Islam. Every hundred years there's been a mujaddid of Islam. And by the testimony of Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah himself, Rahimahullah, 
who according to them, they call him Sheikh al-Islam. Okay, fine, he's your Sheikh al-Islam. Well, he regards Sheikh Abdul Qadr al-Jilani, rahimahullah, may God have mercy on his eternal soul, one of the greatest, greatest awliya Allah, one of the greatest saints in the history of humanity. Sheikh Abdul Qadr al-Jilani, he regards him to be from the Ahmad al-Islam, from the mm-hmm. Imams of the Muslims. So what kind of Islam are we living in the world today when you can't even mention his name in a khutbah or mention his name in a mosque without That's being right. branded without being branded an innovator, uh, somebody who's against Orthodox Islam, somebody who's on the boundaries of a stuff of they'll call you a mushrik nowadays. The Muslims nowadays who will rush to call you a polytheist, a kafir. They'll call you a kafir Correct. because you just didn't mention the word Sufi. Yeah, I, I so think you it's... Want to yeah, you want to talk about the 800-pound gorilla, the elephant in the room? Right. I agree. Are, I, I mean, poison. this is a fundamentally sick and poison understanding of Islam correct. that is so pervasive. You know, it's, we don't like to admit it, man. It hurts our feelings. Imam al-Ghazali, right. Imam al-Ghazali told us why we should be listening to Paul, to uh, sorry, uh, Rupert Murdoch and Steve Emerson and uh, Bill Maher and uh, Bill Riley. And Sam Harris, Imam Ghazali told us 900 years ago why we should listen to that. He wrote in a book called Kitab Riyadatul Nafs. That's right. The book on disciplining the, the two desires. Self, breaking the two desires. These are two different books, from, from book number 22 and 23, from the 40 book Magnum Opus. Now he's, he's the, his great life work, the Hiya Ulumuddin, the revival of the religious sciences. He writes in that book that there are four ways. For a man to come to learn the faults in his soul. In other words, if you really want to be, be honest about uh, traversing a spiritual path, you want to know what's wrong with you, there are four ways you can do that. Number one, he says, find a real sheikh. Find a true master of the spiritual path who can be trusted and who is authentic and, and can, you, can establish, you can establish his credentials, etc., etc. And put, you, put him in charge of your soul, and that is how you can come to know the... the Faults of your soul. And he even says, by the way, this is 900 years ago. He died in the year 1111 of the Common Era. So he says at that time, he defines the attributes of a real sheikh. And he writes, at that time, such a man is hardly to be found in this age. (laughs) Okay? So already he's putting it out there that this is going to be very difficult. It's a tall order to find a real, true saint of God. Of course, part of that is his own humility, because he himself is one of the greatest who ever lived. But part of it is... Also, not false humility. He is literally warning us it's that hard to find somebody of that caliber. Okay, fine. That's point number one. So find a sheikh. Number two, he says, if you cannot find a sheikh, find a real, honest, sincere Muslim brother who you regard to be superior to you and put him in authority over your soul and consult with him in every, every step of the way and ask him sincerely to advise you and counsel you and show you how your, your real ugly Nafs, your ugly self. Hmm. And we know from famous, we know famously from, for example, uh, Hazrat Omar's life, you know, Omar ibn al Khattab, the second caliph of Islam, one of the best friends of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. God bless him and keep him. Hazrat Omar used to uh, literally have in his employ people whose job it was to just remind him constantly, you're going to die. Uh, he, would, he would call in, you know, um, the, the Prophet's uh, uh, confidant who knew the names of the hypocrites. And he would ask him to tell me, what did you see about me? Uh, what, what, what anything you noticed about me? What did you notice people saying about me behind my back? Because maybe that's, that's going to reveal to me how I really am, the ugly, real ugly me, the ugly side of me, and that I can become better. So this is incredible. This is the kind of sincerity it takes to truly uh, battle your own demons of your ego. So that's the second way. Number one, find a shake. Number two, find a really good friend and put him in authority over your soul. Number three, he says, go out into the world. And just observe people and mm. find everybody, everybody who has a good quality and look at yourself and see, do I have that quality? If you have it, thank God. If you don't, strive to acquire it. If you go out and observe people, find every negative quality you see people have. Look at yourself, see if you have it. If you have it, rid yourself to, uh, strive to rid yourself of it. If you don't have it, thank God you don't have it. And in this way, the world will become a teacher. He says that that's what uh, Jesus Christ, alayhi salatu was salam, uh, peace and blessings of God on his soul, uh, that Jesus himself said that the whole world was my teacher. Now listen to this. This is why I brought it up. The fourth way to know the faults of your soul, he says, is to listen very carefully to the statements of your enemies. Hmm. Because in every one of their criticisms is a nugget of truth. Wow. Right. 
we, if we consider the Muslims to be a, one social body on earth, one ummah, as the Prophet himself has taught us we are, we're one body, okay? Our body, if we listen carefully to the critiques of our enemies, our body is sick. It is suffering from cancer. Mm-hmm. And this is what, what, what uh, Rupert Murdoch called, Rupert Murdoch in his now infamous tweet called the jihadist cancer. The tweet her on, okay. heard around and the world. Our ulama, our ulama right. secretly talk about this behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. Our ulama, our ulama secretly talk about this behind closed doors. This is a secret, uh, this is an open secret that these people who in the name of basically Wahhabism or the doctrine, the, the, the deviant theological notions of, of, of Muhammad ibn Abdul, Abdul Wahhab, they are now teaching such a perverse inversion of true classical Islam that they are destroying Islam from the inside. Is there any conscientious Muslim on earth who has not by now received the email forwards talking about how these Wahhabis are literally, literally destroying the physical proofs that we have left on earth of our own history, destroying mm-hmm. classical, ancient, ancient relics of er- the earliest Islam. That's the right. The prophet's tomb. There's chatter about trying to break it down and, and make a mall over there and move his remains. The, even if that's uh, been exaggerated as hyperbole or just a manufactured story, to, well, there's no secret. They've destroyed, you know, the, the house are, of uh, Khadija. They destroyed right. the house of, of uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. Why do they do all this? Because in the name of their perverse, sick, and disgusting perversion and inversion of reality. Whereas for a thousand years, a thousand years, scholarly orthodoxy for, of the inward and the outward sciences of Islam never had any problem whatsoever with not only preserving, but sanctifying and, 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 and honoring and, 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 and loving and going and visiting with love and reverence and respect these incredibly important sacred relics and sacred uh, artifacts and sacred yeah. archaeological ruins of our civilization, yeah. whereas nobody had a problem with it for a thousand years. These people have come along in the modern age, again, in the aftermath of colonialism, destroying every notion of Muslim identity and orthodoxy and continuity of Muslim tradition and Muslim history. And now these people have come forward and are literally destroying Islam. Right. And I mean, you know, again, it would be remiss not to, you know, mention the fact that, uh, you know, petrodollars have a lot to do with it, you know, and the fact that, ironically enough, or I don't know if this is irony or not, uh, we record this show, um, and just hours ago, there was news that uh, King Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia passed away. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't uh, want to comment on. I don't want to comment on you know anybody in particular. Right. right. Yes. And you know, know, I want to make for the sake of the listeners. You know, this is I've been wanting to say this other since you know just just hearing you sort of passionately talk about uh, all of this is that I mean I think that if 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 if, if anybody were to study objectively. Muslim tradition, Muslim history, one would uh, come to the conclusion that what you, uh, what you are uh, articulating is not polemical, but rather no. it is, no. has been the, the, the tradition of Islam throughout, you know, and okay. so, uh, so the, yeah. The, the fact that today it's being framed, this discourse correct. is not is polemical. Right, proves exactly. The very, proves right, the very right. point I'm trying to make. That's right, that's right. The framework of the discussion has been hijacked by those who want to somehow otherize the Sawuf and people of Sufism as if they're, they're on the outskirts and they're, they're on the boundaries of orthodoxy. When mm-hmm. in fact, if anything, they have been at the center of mainstream orthodoxy for, you know, and now, now having said that, are there problematic ideas mm-hmm. and ignorant practices that some people in the history of Islam, you know, in the name of Sufism, tried to introduce into religion? Of Absolutely. course there are. Right. Are there problematic practices of you know things that they would do in terms of venerating saints mm-hmm. and perhaps praying to saints or apparently praying to saints or going to the graves of saints and committing all kinds of you know um, deviant uh, religious type practices? Of course that's all true. Nobody is denying that. But right. like any intelligent person knows, the cliche expression applies here. You that's don't right. throw the baby out with the bathwater. Bathwater. That's right. You don't throw the baby out with the. And, the, and by the way, those are all practices done by ignorant people. Who have mm-hmm. not properly studied the religion? Show me any one proper scholar of religion who mm-hmm. studied the religion and justified or defended any of those kind of deviant practices. Never. That's On the right. contrary, the scholars of the Sawab 
who are balanced people, who are people of not only scholarly religious ilm, knowledge of the outward mm-hmm. sciences, and mm-hmm. also deeply committed to spiritual practice, they always put forth credible, mainstream, balanced arguments that show us over and over again that true mainline orthodoxy, the central, centrist, middle-of-the-road Sunni Islam is people who are balanced, who have both the inward and the outward. And the way Imam Malik summed it up very poetically, right. very, very poetically in one sentence, he said, he said, Man tashara wa lam one who practices outward religion but has no inward spirituality, he becomes a sinner. Mm-hmm. The one mm-hmm. who has inward spiritual reality but he doesn't practice any religion, he becomes a heretic. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, the one who has outward religion and has inward spirituality, he truly has arrived at at ultimate reality. So that's our path. That is Sunni Islam. If there is a path forward, if there is a way to get us out of this mess, it is to revive centrist, balanced Islam, to campaign against all extremism on all sides, those who are calling to outward extremism and those who are calling to inward extremism, those who just want Sufism and you know want to talk about you can be a Sufi without being a Muslim, nonsense, and those who say that you know somehow... Uh, you know, Sufism is, is anathema to Islam and has no place in, in Orthodox Islam. Those people are also calling to an extreme type of doctrine. And we have to really become more vocal, I believe, uh, based on my conversations with my teachers. But we're scared to be branded Sufis and brand, you know, brand me whatever you want, man. I'm not a, I'm not too faithful to labels and tribes and tribal mentality. When I became a, a believing Muslim, as, as Sheikh Hamza once said, I didn't draw, join a tribe called Bunny Islam. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's right. I, I joined. I joined a, tri- a tribe called La Ilaha Illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I mm. believe in in fundamental truth and the principle the principle of truth. My loyalty to truth will trump all these labels, all these categories, all this problem problematizing of the of each other and otherizing of each other. I don't. Mm. I don't care about that stuff. What I care about is I want to live the truth. I want to practice Islam now, according to the teaching of the Prophet, as understood by the Sahaba the Tabi'een, the Taba Tabi'een, and the Orthodox, mainline, Orthodox, Sunni, mainstream teachers throughout the history of Islam, and according to every age. And I want to find those guys who are alive today <laughs> who are making this scholarly tradition relevant for us in the modern world, because the modern world is, in many ways, a new reality. It is an evolved form of itself. It is a place now that is ruled by, as we talked about earlier, mass media images, and technology, and global capitalism, and power politics, and political identity movements, and a, a, a renewed sense of gender equity, and a place where slavery is outlawed. And a place, it's a new world. It's a new. There are new. Yeah. There are rules. The, the, right. the dunya has its own type of phenomenon that God unleashes into the world, and it's the job of the real scholars who build the bridges to take traditional understanding, classical understanding of tradition and make it livable and implementable and operationalizable for the modern lived reality, the global monoculture, as Abdul Hakim Murad calls it. So I, I, I wanna, I'm down with those cats. I, I love those people, <laughs> teachers, and I, and, I, and I will go to the ends of yeah. the earth to find those cats. Yeah, well, I, I know, Zaki, I know you are uh, – uh, we are – Close to running out of time, if not already. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Azar is one of those guests that I mean, we could literally do a series with Azar, uh, or we could just add Azar as a third ge- uh, as a third host. Right. All this really means is is Azar, you got to come back on. You got to come back. Because, yeah. Because yeah. we didn't even scratch the surface of your oh, comedy yeah. career and and uh, <laughs> uh, some of the other issues that have been going on. Right. Right. You know, it's perhaps the biggest joke of my whole appearance on this. On this. No, yeah, no, I think it was beautiful, Azur. And I, I think, well, you know, a couple of things that I, I wanted to also remind the listeners um, is, is that, you know, a lot, so much of what you have said and what you've talked about throughout the show, uh, and especially I think near the near the end of what we were talking about in terms of trying to 
to identify sort of where 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 we went wrong, you know, what went wrong or where we went wrong, and and identifying those factors that have contributed to that, uh, uh, to that, you know, um, is is you know, there's the, an exploration of this from but but from a completely different point of view, a more anthropological point of view, is actually a, a, a book by one of our previous guests called Islam is a Foreign Country, American yeah. Muslims and the Global Crisis of Authority. And in fact, a lot of what you, what you, what, what you were talking about you know, sort of echoed um, not only the title, and that's Zirina Graywall, uh, who we had on a few episodes ago, uh, but just you know, the idea of Islam being you know, the, uh, Islam is a foreign country. And again, you were talking about the crisis of authority. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, early on you were touching upon this notion of where our tradition um, gets its legitimacy from. And, 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 and uh, uh, you know, that's the whole idea of diffuse congruence, which is, interestingly enough, a translation of the idea or the concept of Tawato. Yes. Yes. So that's, yeah, indeed. <laughs> No, no, let me just say one thing because I know we want to talk about the, what happened in Paris and the shooting of these cartoonists and all that stuff. And, and, and I don't want to get into the specifics of it, actually, the, the yeah. facts. But I want to talk about it for a moment just in terms of what the incident represents and what it highlights. Because it underscores something that we have been talking about, which is the crisis of authority. And this is really, really where the rubber meets the road is because there is a crisis of authority in Sunni Islam today. Because what is the real ruling? You know, what is the ruling, quote unquote, if there is one ruling? What is the ruling of Orthodox Sunni Islam regarding, for example, Ridda, apostasy? What is the ruling of Sunni Orthodox Islam regarding, you know, blasphemy? Blasphemy, so called blasphemy. Yeah. Well, I'm saying these, all this, this category of, of blasphemy and apostasy are often uh, grouped together in the classical discourse. Correct. So, so what, what is the ruling? And, and when it comes to blasphemy, what is the ruling of you know Muslims who commit blasphemy and non-Muslims who commit blasphemy? And is it true that you know the the, the, the rulings that are on the books right now do say that the, the punishment for blasphemy is is death and there is no repentance? And I was because those are the rulings that are on the books, and and we got to stop pretending that this is not what the, what the books say. That's so right. this presents some real serious challenges and riddles that we, Muslim scholars need to start you know step into the plate and start confronting these issues head-on, taking some original positions That's that right. might have to buck tradition. Because so long as they remain shackled by tradition in the mistaken belief that they're somehow respecting tradition by preserving tradition, they could actually be unintentionally contributing toward the demonic game of destroying the religion from the inside out. Allahu Adam, God knows best. And I'm wow. nobody to comment on this. I'm, re- I'm just repeating some of the, again, private, secret conversations that I hear from among people of real knowledge, well, they'll make the case for this, but it's like, dude, well, come on, step to the plate then. What are you going to do about it? Right. And there's so few people on earth doing this that, you know, God have mercy on us. Man. We're living through very dangerous times. So to me, what's most interesting about this Charlie Hebdo thing is that, look, we can talk about the politics till we're in the face. No reasonable person on earth denies that murder is wrong, morally unjustifiable. Nobody should be murdered for drawing some cartoons, no matter how offensive they are. But the real conversation behind the conversation is, if a lot of Muslims feel in privately and secretly in their hearts, like, well, those guys deserved it. They, they were trying to insult the prophet. They deserve to die. Well, where's that coming from? And is yeah. that really what Islam teaches? And if it does, well, is that good or bad? And if it right. doesn't, how do we get that get rid of that sickness? Because that's a pretty evil thing to think that somebody should die. You know, where's the where's the mercy of like, you know, having praying that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala forgive those people, God forgive them and guide them to the truth. Mm-hmm. They don't even know the prophet. You know, they're they're. Their depictions comedically and cart- in, through cartoons, their depictions and attempts to portray the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God bless him and keep him, is basically the modern equivalent of those Qurayshi Meccans who tried to insult him by yeah. giving him an ugly nickname. You know, mm-hmm. they used to call him Mudammam. Mudammam. Insult him, right? the distorted one. And he just commented smiling to his Sahaba, his companions. Said, you know, they, they, they're trying to insult me. They, they, they're not insulting me. They, they insult a guy called Mudamman. My name is Muhammad. They're not even talking about me. So, <laughs> we should have the same attitude, man. They're not drawing the prophet. They're drawing some guy. Yeah. That has a fantasy in their minds of some Correct. phantasm they've invented who is this otherized enemy who represents all their fantasmic fantasy, you know, enemy 
That's not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet is a man, he's rahmatul alameen, he's the mercy to all the multiverse. He was sent as the selfless love, the rahmah lil alameen, to the mm-hmm. multiverse of creation. That's who he is. Mm-hmm. So, man, they can't insult the Prophet, man. A final note, final note on this whole topic. One of the other sick things about identity Islam that produces these so-called Muslim activists who want to defend the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is their, this is their, defend the Prophet. We are going to defend the Prophet. And it's like, dude, if you had any understanding of real, what Islam really teaches, you would come to understand that you don't defend the Prophet. The Prophet defends you. Mm. He is the Shifa. He is the Shifa. He is, the, right. he is going to defend you. When you believe in him and you testify that you have entered the Ummah, the community of the Prophet Muhammad, the Milla, the believing community of our father Abraham, our grandfather Abraham, when you join into this like Voltron-like situation, and you're just like protected <laughs> now by these incredible forces, you have come under the protection. He protects you. You don't protect him. You don't defend him. Who are you to defend him? This is a classic case of Muslim identity politics delusion somehow we are something. I am something. I know I am nothing. I am something. All of it is ego. There is nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Rasul does not need you. You need, you don't need, the messenger of God doesn't need you. You need the messenger. That's so right. this idea that somehow some kafir, some disbeliever, enemy of God, some human devil could insult the prophet and somehow now you're protesting and screaming and writing and burning fires and killing people is right. defending the prophet. It's such a mind job. It is such a perversion of reality, an inversion of reality, that you have been tricked by the devil and you don't even know. That's right. And as you said, I mean, the fact that, uh, and in in no way do these depictions or these cartoons dishonor the prophet. You know? That's right. Beautiful. Yeah. Nice. Allah, Allah, God have mercy on his That's eternal right. Sallallahu alayhi wa And it's, again, I, I think we're still in Rabi Awal, which is the, yeah, the, the month in which we celebrate uh, the birth of the Prophet, peace Allah. be upon him. Well, uh, I think that's actually a good place to uh, wrap things up here. And uh, as I said, this was, I mean, just, uh, I haven't chatted with, with Uzzer in forever. So it was just a thrill for me to just sit back and and just hear him rhapsodize. Because, because um, you, 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 you... Rhapsodize, I love it. You, you, you talk like a preacher, like a, like a preacher man, and I love it. Allah, Allah. I love it just for like people think we are... Uh, you know, there's a beautiful, let's, end on, let's all end on a beautiful dua that's attributed to Hazrat Abu Bakr, a beautiful prayer of Abu Bakr. He used to say, when people would say nice things about him to his face, you know, he's Abu Bakr. I mean, yeah. The prophet, the prophet already, imagine being the guy about who the prophet already testified. Like, yo, this guy is going to paradise. Uh, all right. the of you, I've repaid your debts. I can never repay this guy's debt. Uh, you know, he's, he's my best friend. I mean, like, come on. Imagine, he, well, imagine the, the pressure on his heart and his soul all the time. Right. 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 So people would praise him to his face and he would say, Allahumma la tu la tu akhidni bima yakulun. Dear God, you dear God, do not take me to account, please, for the words that they say about me. Allahumma la tu akhidni bima yakulun. Waghfirli ma la yalamun. Forgive me for the stuff they don't know about me. Wajalli khairu mimma yadunun, and make me in reality even better than they think I am. Subhanallah, beautiful. And then, and then the companion dua we conclude we conclude with this. Hazrat Omar used to make a similar dua. He would say, Allah majalni fi aini sagira wa fi aini nasi kabira. Dear God, mm. make me small and insignificant in my own eyes. In other words, let me recognize over and over again that I'm nothing but a slave of yours and that I'm just a one tiny creature out of the trillions and trillions and trillions that you've made. So let me be humble and let me be truly sincere mm. in being your slave, your abd. Allahumma ja'alni fi aini sagira. Make me, make me tiny and insignificant. In my own eyes, and make me big and important in the eyes of people. And he would make this paradoxical dua because to be a leader and to, it means you have to be followed. Mm. And people don't follow you unless they think you're somebody. Yeah. May Allah wow. make us, may God make us worthy of being followed by truly making us sincere and uh, helping us wage this battle against our own egos 24 7. Because as my, as my Sheikh likes to remind us all the time, Allah Ta'ala ke haan, qabuliyat ka maamala nahi chalta hai. Qabuliyat ka maamala chalta hai. 
Mm. In the in the in the in the eyes of God, when it comes to your final accounting, that's right. Nothing, nothing that you do or no, no capability of yours plays any role. Mm-hmm. So no, no, being kabil, being having ability and being somebody special doesn't play any role in your salvation. The only thing that matters with God is whether He accepts you. May Allah accept us. Amin ya rabbal alamin. Amin. Nice. And um, well, I mean, Azur, like I said, we we definitely need to have you back because, like I said, we we still need to talk about your comedy career. Do it, man. Uh, so so all, all this all this means is is uh, we're putting a pin uh, and and a to be continued uh, That's right. sign at the, at the end of this right. because we're absolutely going to have to continue this conversation. But but in the meantime, uh, I'm sure people will want to uh, track you down online. Uh, what what are uh, your hangouts online? Where can people find yeah, you? Yeah, well, I mean, basically, I got a website. It's really bad. I need some help, but uh, this website is just azhar.com, a z h r dot com, and off my website, I got a link to my Twitter and my Facebook stuff. So. Perfect. So, so to, just go to uzher dot com and and uh, every, every oh, that's that's the, the central port. We can go wherever we need to from there. Yes. And then and then finally, I would first of all thank you for inviting me back on. I'd love to come on. I'd love to talk about comedy and art, but I also want to put it out there that I want to talk about faith, atheism, doubt, skepticism, agnosticism, and and the relationship between these phenomena because that I'm convinced is where the conversation needs to go. Every all the young people I meet. Are riddled with doubts, <laughs> and, and and we got we got to tackle this, take take this bull by the horns. That's right. Well, there, that that was the the coming attractions for for next time. When, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that was the trailer. Um, but but with that, um, I, I want to thank our listeners again for for making our, our last episode, which which featured uh, Asif Mandvi, uh, another big success. And and we're we're very we consider ourselves very lucky. I mean, my gosh, we're we're just able to get a fantastic assortment of people to come on every month. So we're we're very very grateful for that. And I just want to remind people again, please do hit up iTunes and Stitcher Radio, write us a review, leave us a star ranking, let us know how we're doing. Uh, because that's the only way we can keep improving. You can also write us an email at diffusecongruence at gmail.com and also hit up our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Uh, that brings us to the end of another episode, but uh, we do look forward to you joining us next month. So on behalf of our guest, Azar Usman, as well as my co-host, Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan, and uh, we'll catch you next month.